another like stairway up though. Yeah. Oh.
Hello, everybody. We are going to begin shortly with the fifth panel. So if everyone can take a seat, please. Okay, uh, everybody, we're going to start our fifth panel. Um, Maya Starcevic, I teach at Windward School. Uh, it's been wonderful to be here today. Always oh, such an inspirational day. Thank you, um, uh, Brian and the organizers for, for making it possible for us. Uh, so today we're going to have our power trips panel um, examining all kinds of uh, more and more older literature. So we'll have Christian Zada from Loyola, Lucas Schauberg from Windward, and Anthony Resnick also from Loyola. Unfortunately, Eliana Sabo, who is a, one of my students at Windward, uh, got a really bad case of the flu and uh, she could not make it today. Um, and we're really, we're gonna miss her. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Christian. Hello, I'm Christian Zeta from Loyola High School, and I'm a junior there. And my paper is titled, When Human Voices Are Veiled in Sleep, Semiotics and the Anglo-Saxon Subconscious in the Dream of the Rude. My paper and this presentation focus on how the author of the Anglo-Saxon narrative poem titled The Dream of the Rude reconciles the symbolic and archetypal aspects of the two dissimilar cultural traditions of Anglo-Saxon paganism and Roman Catholicism. My paper ana analyzes how the author merges these two cultures within the setting of a subconscious dream state in an attempt to convert the dreaming speaker of the poem and by extension the Anglo-Saxon audience to Christianity. In my analysis of the poem, I use theories from the field of semiotics, which was pioneered by Ferdinand de Saussure. Semiotics is a study of signs and symbolism, relating to the way in which symbols shape our perception of the world, our culture, and ourselves, and how we create and interpret meaning based on symbolism. As for the historical context of The Dream of the Rood, it is one of the oldest works of Anglo-Saxon literature dating back to the 8th century, with carvings found on the famous Ruthwell Cross. Like many Anglo-Saxon literary works, the author is unknown, but it was most likely, com most likely composed by a Catholic monk in present-day England. The poem itself is predicated upon the merging of the Anglo-Saxon and Christian cultures in order to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxon people who had a relatively grim and pessimistic worldview, as they were socialized in never-ending cycles of violence driven by blood feuds and clan honor. The author of The Dream of the Rude wanted to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity by presenting a form of the religion that was appealing and that made sense in the context of the Anglo-Saxon cultural tradition. He did this by using, sorry, he did this by using the poem to introduce sense, uh, to introduce hybridized forms of Anglo-Saxon and Christian cultural symbols, like the tree and the cross, archetypes like the Anglo-Saxon warrior and Christ, and narratives like Germanic tribal conquests and the crucifixion which transformed the Anglo-Saxon semiotic understanding of their own culture and opened the door to the Christian conversion. Now, before we examine how the author manipulated these cultural symbols and archetypes in the poem, it's useful to understand how they existed in the two cultures independently before they came together. So the tree had a rich semiotic tradition within the religious tribal culture as an ancient Germanic and Druidic symbol. According to J.A. McCulloch in the book, The Religion of the Ancient Celts, human sacrifices were hung or impaled on trees because the trees were the abode of spirits or divinities who in many cases had power over vegetation. The Germanic culture un also understood the tree as a symbol in relation to the myth of Odin, who according to William Cheney of the Harvard Theological Review stated, has had gained knowledge of runes by sacrificing himself to himself by hanging and fasting on the world tree. Now Cheney asserts that there's good reason to believe that these two traditions are independent 
And if so, he says that this would lead a culture saturated with Odin worship, like the Germanic warrior clan culture, to take up with ease the Christian cult of the new hanging god when the old one proves less potent. Now, the poem itself begins from the perspective of an Anglo-Saxon speaker who recounts the events of a surreal dream he had about an anthropomorphic wooden cross that spoke to him. The dream is staged like a divine revelation, where the cross appears adorned in gold and jewels and bathed in a heavenly light while angels watch on, indicating that it is indeed the cross of Christ's crucifixion. The dream state provides a fertile ground for symbolic paradox and ambivalence to take root, which confuses the Anglo-Saxon speaker and the rest of the Anglo-Saxon audience that would have heard the poem performed. The dream state where the poem is set in enables a fluid, ambivalent imagery to manifest because the dreamer's vision is liberated from reality's bounds on conscious experience and perception. A prime example of this symbolic ambivalence occurs when the speaker says, beneath that gold the cross had begun, bleeding on the right side. I beheld the sign rapidly, changing clothing and colors. Now it was covered with moisture, drenched with streaming blood, now decked in treasure. The author initiates the Christian Anglo-Saxon hybridization in the confused, indeterminate condition of the dream by merging the materialistic Germanic warrior culture in the form of the gold treasure with the spiritual sublime aspects of Catholicism, represented by the allusion to Christ's spear wound on the cross. The author further relates the, Anglo the Christian cultural tradition to the dreamer and greater Anglo-Saxon culture through the use of parallelism and biblical allusion. The author employs this parallel language that describes states of emotion or action, such as to behold, to suffer, having few followers, and sorrow and uses them to describe the Anglo-Saxon speaker in the same terms as multiple biblical figures. The author overlaps the two cultural traditions by associating biblical history with the Anglo-Saxon speaker and the Anglo-Saxon culture, thereby laying the foundation for the coming semiotic associations that will take root later in the poem. Later in the narrative, the cross assumes the role of the first person speaker and tells a story of how it was chopped down as a tree, shaped into a cross, and accepted the task of hoisting up the, a, an unusually triumphant Christ during the crucifixion. The author appeals to the violent warrior culture of the Anglo-Saxons by framing the crucifixion as a battle and by portraying the cross and Christ as the Anglo-Saxons' ideal male archetype of victorious, defiant warriors who demonstrate clan loyalty in their battle against the Roman soldiers. For example, the cross says, I was cut down at the edge of the forest, torn up from my trunk. Their powerful enemies took me. Christ is also described as victorious in venturing forth, mighty and triumphant when he returned with many. The author depicts Christ as an Anglo-Saxon warrior king that reigns victorious in the Last Judgment and spoils his loyal thanes with treasure. But this type of treasure is metaphorically spiritual, and it's not material. The author introduces the dreamer and by extension the Anglo-Saxon culture to a new interpretation of value in life that moves away from the emphasis on material wealth to a focus on spiritual salvation as the spoils of earthly victory. The speaking cross eventually converts the awe-inspired dreamer and his melancholic tone is uplifted as he relinquishes the Anglo-Saxon material cultural norms and awaits eternal life in heaven. Now, by consolidating multiple Anglo-Saxon and Christian cultural symbols, archetypes, and narratives, the author manipulates the Anglo-Saxon cultural identity from the depths of the dream state's ambivalent subconscious condition, where all natural law and linguistic order is forfeited for an emphasis on the inexplicable surrealism of the cultural symbols and archetypes found within the poem. Therefore, the poem exalts symbolism in the form of the sign of the cross as a universal transcendent faculty of unconscious understanding that transcends the epistemic limits of language. Epistemic is the adjective derived from epistemology, which is a branch of philosophy concerned with the theory of knowledge. Therefore, the unconscious processes involved with the knowledge garnered by interpreting symbols are far more foundational than the processes of linguistic understanding. This semiotic theory is echoed in the philosopher and psychoanalyst John Mill's book titled Origins on the Genesis of Psychic Reality. From the chapter on semiotics, Mills claims that on the level of unconscious experience, signification, symbol formation, and fantasy are radically subjective, thereby disfiguring language, and in turn reshaping it through self-imposed unconscious signifiers, potentially defying universal laws. Mills also describes unconscious fantasy and semiotics as pre-linguistic and translinguistic. The dream's hybridized cultural symbols semiotically permeate the private subconscious of the dreamer and the collective Anglo-Saxon cultural subconscious, effecting the Anglo-Saxon cultural indoctrination in a way that structured language alone never could without the reordering of the culture's semiotic substructure. In the poem, the speaking cross states that they shall fear and few shall think what to contrive to say to Christ, but no one there needs be afraid who bears the best sign on his breast. The author directly affirms the fundamental nature of the cross as a symbol that transcends language or the thought associated with formulating this language. This type of symbolic and archetypal understanding manifests itself in the depths of a culture's collective unconscious, thereby playing an integral role in the formation of a shared cultural identity by semiotically structuring all meaning derived from a culture's tradition. 
John Mills again expands on this foundational relationship between a universally shared cultural identity and the culture's subconscious semiotic structure. He describes unconscious processes as the deepest level of internal stimulation within the matrix of signification. The Dream of the Root further affirms this notion of the essential relationship between a culture's identity and its pre-linguistic unconscious semiotic framework by reorientating the Anglo-Saxon semiotic structure and therefore the entire Anglo-Saxon cultural identity, as evident by the efficacy of the Anglo-Saxon conversion to Christianity. Oops. Um, the transmutation of the Anglo-Saxon speaker's voice from a pagan shamanistic dreamer to a saved Christian disciple cements the speaker's truly transformed cultural consciousness. The ease by which this manipulation of the Anglo-Saxon culture is perpetrated affirms the fragility and malleability of all of our cultural tradition and identity that is universally shared within a culture's collective unconscious. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, I'm Lucas. I'm from Winward. I'm a senior. Uh, I'm going to be, hold on, let me. Okay, there we go. I'm going to be talking about Hamlet from a Marxist point of view, which for this presentation means I'll be looking at how the economic system of the play's society influences its events and characters. The main point I'll be tackling is who has the power and why, how that power impacts events and characters, and finally, how this kind of analysis is applicable to the present day. So for this first question of who actually has the power in this society, I turn to this lovely fellow, Terence Eagleton, and his own Marxist work, Shakespeare and Society. Uh, in his section on Hamlet, Eagleton gives many examples of characters who are manipulated and manipulate each other, which is sort of the fundamental expression of power in Hamlet's world of palace intrigue, but he fails to note any overall pattern in the directionality of his interactions. Because Hamlet takes place in a feudalist society, power is granted to characters in a rigid hierarchy based on their birth, and manipulation can only flow from the top down, or sometimes side to side, but never from the bottom up. Taking a look here at some of the lowest class characters in the play, the various courtiers and functionaries that populate the Danish court, we can see from Eagleton's analysis that they pretty much only do what people tell them. They are totally subservient, what Eagleton calls agents of the higher class characters, and because they have essentially surrendered their free will to society, they are basically incapable of acting autonomously. Moving one rung up the ladder to Mr. Polonius, uh, he's really the quintessential example of the noble class. These people are the middle managers, basically the Michael Scotts of feudalism. <laughs> um, they were given resources such as money, authority, and servants by the ruler, and they could use them freely to manipulate servants like Reynaldo and other nobles like Laertes uh, but the price was that they always had to stay subservient to the royal class. Represented by Hamlet, Claudius, and Gertrude, the royal class is immune to manipulation by anyone not royal, and they know it. Polonius here tries to disrupt that hierarchy by exerting influence over Hamlet, but he learns the hard way that he just doesn't have the power. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't take that lesson to heart, and he later relearns it the sharp way when Hamlet stabs him in his heart. Real power move from Hamlet on that one. Uh, so now that we've seen who has the power, how does that power cause the play to play out? It turns out that it goes about how you might think. Characters of higher class have the power, so they're able to avoid the consequences of their actions, while characters of lower class are forced to suffer in their place. This privilege is visible in the noble class as pretty much regular old special treatment. Now, I just want to say here that suicide and mental illness are serious issues, and blaming and shaming their victims is wrong. But in this time and place, that's what society ordinarily did. Suicide victims, such as Ophelia, were considered impure, and were normally forbidden from being buried with Christian ceremony. However, the influence of Ophelia's noble family within the feudal system allowed them to pass her death off as an accident, sparing them the pain of a shameful funeral that a lower class family would have had to endure. But nobility, remember, is in the middle. So they have to take the bad with the good. Polonius has been in the game for a while, and he knows this. So he tries to keep Ophelia away from Hamlet in order to protect her from the consequences of her own action, of the consequences of actions that Hamlet might be forced by his own position to take. Excuse me. But again, he just doesn't have the power here. Uh, he and Ophelia both get caught up in Hamlet's scheming because Hamlet wants them to, and as a result, they both end up dead. The nobility has their ups and downs with these power dynamics, but these effects are nothing compared to the total immunity from accountability that is afforded to the royalty. 
Hamlet literally stabs a guy to death in front of his mother, and not just anyone, the king's second in command. And yet the feudal order physically will not allow him to be punished. The king would love to do it, but the whole country would rise up against him because they view violating the social order by punishing a royal as worse than the actual murder. His only option is to export justice out of the feudal society to England, but even that doesn't work because Hamlet easily manipulates his lower class escort and waltzes back to Denmark unscathed. So that's how feudalism affects what happens to the characters, but what does that mean for how they act and think? Uh, it's honestly kind of disturbing. Characters of lower class basically have to suborn themselves entirely to their superiors, and characters of higher class seem to lose the ability to treat those below them as fellow humans rather than unfeeling pawns. Back on the earlier point of autonomy, Laertes is a grown man, and decently high ranking too, but even he is expected to bow his thoughts and wishes to the gracious leave and pardon of his dread lord. This is the kind of blatantly sycophantic language you might expect to see used for a big favor, like a piece of land or a job or a title of some sort, but Laertes' big favor is his own freedom of movement, which we would today consider a basic human right. One might think that a young romantic like Hamlet would try to relax these standards, standards a bit, maybe connect with his future subjects, but no dice. He casually threatens cruel and unusual punishment to any actors whose plays he doesn't like, uh, to the actors who are about to perform a play for him. And remember how much power he has. Those actors know that he could totally do it if he wanted to, and that Hamlet either doesn't recognize what he's doing or doesn't care shows how little empathy he has for the people whose society values less than him. And if you had any doubt left about how little he cares about people who aren't royalty, take a look at this right here. He leaves his college buddies, who are only acting against him on the orders of the ruler of the country, to be executed, because he can. His closest friend Horatio asks if he feels any guilt over killing them, and he says, not even close. Why? Not because he thought they deserved it for betraying him, and, uh, but th because they, as non-royalty, are baser, while he and the king are mighty. And it's their own fault for being in a position to become collateral damage, even though they, possessing little to no power, had no other choice. By virtue of his power as a feudal royal, Hamlet has become desensitized to the suffering of people he sees as lesser, even when their suffering is caused by him. And now, everyone's favorite question. If we don't have feudalism anymore, why should we care? Well, it's true, there is no king of the United States, but we do have capitalism, where power is dictated by private wealth rather than by birth. Uh, I was originally going to talk about Facebook for obvious reasons, but in light of recent events, there's an example that hits closer to home. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us have recently applied to college or are starting the process. Uh, I personally am getting a decision back in two hours. Thoughts and prayers, please. <laughs> um, in the whole application system, we are most like the nobility. We have access to resources that others do not. And if we get sloppy and make mistakes, as kids do, we have people around us who know the process and can help us in legal and ethical ways uh, avoid <laughs> suffering too much from them. But it would be irresponsible not to acknowledge that many kids around the country don't have these invisible advantages and as a result have fewer options and can afford to make fewer mistakes. Uh, unfortunately, Hamlet is a tragedy, so there's not much to be observed there in terms of ways to even out our modern day hierarchy. But on the bright side, they just arrested all the royalty for cheating, so <laughs> there may be hope for us yet. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anthony Resnick from Loyola High School, and my title is, It May Be Best to Have Kept the Old Accepted Laws, How Aeschylus' and Sophocles' Tragedies Advance Athenian Democracy. I will be presenting how Aeschylus' Oristia and Sophocles' Oedipus Rex and Antigone contributed to the political power shift in Athens from tyranny, which is defined as a ruler who has absolute power in a state, to a radical democracy in the 5th century BC. 800 to 500 BC, this was a time known as the Archaic Period where blood revenge was the dominant social norm. During the Archaic Period, tyrants arose as usurpers to the aristocratic class throughout all of Greece. These tyrants utilized unrest and contempt from average suppressed citizens to overthrow the nobles and ruling councils and royalty. However, these same citizens soon realized the single all-powerful ruler perpetuated their suppression. This power struggle and conflict between Greek commoners and those in power destabilizes the status quo political realm, allowing for the advent of democracy. 
To initially garner support, the tyrants enacted pro-commerce policies and spent money on public buildings, festivals, and the arts. Specifically, the tyrant in Athens commissioned the building of the Theater of Dionysus, which provided entertainment, mainly in the forms of plays or dramas. While the plays ostensibly entertained, certain playwrights such as Aeschylus and Sophocles become agents of change by incorporating thematic messages into their tragedies that both contribute to the destabilizing of the aristocracy and tyranny and advance emerging democratic values of the time. Aeschylus's Oristia stresses centrality to the divine authority and redefines social justice, and Sophocles' Oedipus and Antigone portray the unforgiving harsh nature of Atronus' rule and its plaguing effects on the citizens. Together, the tragedians provide recognition to the average Athenian citizen and educate their preliterate audience, commenting with political undertones the direct concerns of Athenian democracy in order to establish a stable Greek society. How did they do this? Through literary techniques that utilize repetition in order to emphasize these thematic messages to preliterate audiences. As we all know intuitively, repeating a message conditions the receiver to recall the information more quickly and more accurately. Although Aeschylus and Sophocles may not have understood the cognitive development, they reinforced their messages to a preliterate Greek audience by actively incorporating these repetition-based literary techniques into their plays. Aeschylus structures the Oristai with layers of ring composition, a literary device that concludes a section with the repetition of its opening idea to emphasize religious piety and a need to redefine the idea of justice in his society, and it's denoted by the arrows in the top right corner. Sophocles crafts both Oedipus and Antigone with nautical metaphors, comparing the Tyrannus' leadership of Thebes to sailing a ship during inclement weather to present Greek audiences which understood the dangers of the sea with the hardships of ruling. What unites Aeschylus and Sophocles together is their use of variant repetition-based literary devices. Remember, Aeschylus, ring composition, Sophocles, nautical metaphors. And as a result, they resonate with the audience psychologically and democratic concepts become introduced to average preliterate Greek citizens. The Oristia is a trilogy of Greek tragedies that follows the house of Atreus, you know, the family of Agamemnon and his son Orestes. The prologues of each play contain ring composition that frame justice as uncivilized and beseech the gods for assistance, and the Oristia viewed in its entirety contains an overall ring composition that transforms the original barbaric justice through blood revenge into a civilized justice instituted by the gods themselves. For time's sake, I will only be discussing the ring compositions around AG and the overarching ones. The Oristia begins with, I ask the gods for release from this misery. This request is from a Mycenaean watchman who is waiting up top a tower for his king Agamemnon to return from the Trojan War. This request initiates the overall theme of the gods' centrality to human society, but also speaks to a social misery as a reflection of society's barbaric and ventral way of life. The misery here has a twofold meaning. Firstly, his conscious misery vanishes when Agamemnon's return is signaled by a fire lit by the gods under Mount Ida, Mount Ida, ending the ring composition within the prologue. Secondly, misery is an appropriate description word for the social lawlessness where personal vendettas lead to strife and instability among citizens. This volatility and calling upon the gods drives the plot to lead to an intervention by the theos, or gods. That the watchman ends his prologue saying, I wish for a happy release from misery, indicates reconciliation facilitated by the gods must occur so that Greek society progresses civilly. In Eumenides, the last play of the trilogy, Athena comes in full heavenly glory and institutes a court system consisting of a judge and jury to replace their barbaric blood revenge. This concluding thought of the trilogy ends with her Athenian chorus girl saying, thus have Zeus, the all sing and fate, come down together to support the people of Pallas. This exclamatory places the Theos for fixing the misery signaled by the watchman, and the gods promoting of this new law system adds divine authenticity. Furthermore, the psychological ring composition effectively influences the preliterate Greek audience to accept the reformed way of life. This newly defined justice explicitly echoes the rights of Athenian citizens in a court of law and elevates their previous status of primitive manhood to an enlightened manner, thus securing a stable society. Similar to Aeschylus, Sophocles argues for a stable Athenian society and utilizes repetition-based techniques, yet his plays substitute much of the mythology and comment more directly on the nature of the Tyrannus. Sophocles' nautical metaphors, which he experienced during his tenure as an Athenian general on the Mediterranean Sea, served to both reveal the Tyrannus' fatal flaws and their peripeteas, or re reversals of fortune. 
Sophocles defines Oedipus and Creon as pilots or captains of their ship steering Thebes into the sea or the unknown prospects of the future. And further extending upon that metaphor, Oedipus and Creon are related to the Athenian tyrants in the actual society, and Thebes, which is the, the king of that city, relates to Athens. Parallel to the Oresteia's exposition, the plays introduce Thebes in a state of misery, a barren plague in Oedipus Rex, and the aftermath of a civil war in Antigone. Both conflicts induce the Tyranni, who seemingly have noble intentions, to undertake extreme action to rectify the portentous situation that ultimately leads to further political chaos and destabilization. In Oedipus's exposition, the priest, a man of a god, says, uh, the priest, a man of the gods, iterates Thebes's misery in a nautical metaphor. King, our city is reeling like a wreck already. It can scarcely lift its prow out of the bloody surf. This quote signifies the unsteady condition of Thebes and leads directly to the Tronus's both selflessness and overconfidence in undertaking the task to study the vessel. Oedipus pursues the truth to its full extent and learns of his social offenses. He killed his father and slept with his mother. Concludingly, Oedipus asked someone to throw him into the sea. Oedipus ultimately sacrificed everything of himself, including his title as captain, on his navigation through the unknown waters to steady a sinking Thebes. Sophocles develops Creon more starkly. The tyrant attempts to sail Thebes against the will of the people. Like Oedipus, Creon assumes absolute power and responsibility for fixing Thebes' disorder. Remember, Antigone begins post-Civil War. He says, if she sails upright and we sail on her, friends will be ours for the making. I will make her greater still. Though the king possesses the correct motives to mend Thebes, he obstinately imprisons Antigone, a symbol of the citizen's will. Later, Antigone's suicide disconnects the Tyrannus' rule with the citizen's will. The tyrant's unstable leadership is further magnified when Creon debates his son Hymen. Hymen says, the man who keeps the sheet of his sail tight and never slackens capsizes his boat. The average Greek understood this metaphor to compare Creon to an unwise ruler that resorts to extremes and fails to compromise, thus revealing Creon's fatal flaw and leading to his reversal of fortune when his family members murder themselves. Equal to Oedipus's ending, Creon asks for someone to lead him away, signifying the failure of the tyrant's rule and leaving an opening for a democratic government. As the actual Athenian tyrants did, Creon and Oedipus rise from political discord, the misery, and attempt to exert their power for change but fail in their effects due to hubris. Sophocles intends to express the political power struggle and suggests that the tyrant will ultimately reveal himself to be self-centered and looking to maintain power, not in the interests of the Greek citizens or for the stability of the Greek society. To recap, Aeschylus, is, Aeschylus addresses the blood revenge society, for without proper civilized justice instituted by the gods, the lawlessness of a barbaric human society would continue. A more stable Greek society first needs to be rooted in a proper legal system, much like how the U.S. is structured today. Sophocles contemplates a more direct approach by setting the tyrants as tragic characters whose flaws lead themselves, who lead themselves in society into despair and disorder, thus placing the nature of the Tyrannus in opposition to the emerging democratic values that stabilize society. In essence, Aeschylus and Sophocles serve as an ancient media that helps shape perception and influence those that watch the plays. The repetition-based literary techniques that appeal to the audience's psychological disposition to simplicity and a yearning to influence their own fate, the tragedy and advanced themes that deal with the political power struggles. Their politically infused works, acted out in the mid-5th century, become conduits for emerging democratic beliefs that permeate through ancient Greek society. That Athens converts to a radical democracy in the late 5th century is a testament to the successful impact of the Greek tragedians. Thank you. All right, we're going to open it up for questions now. Hi, um, my question is for Christian. Uh, you talked about the uh, malleability of the collective unconscious and how these Christian monks were perhaps trying to utilize that to force or convert people to Christianity. Uh, I want, could you speak to uh, the intentional or unintentional use of the dream state, as you said, as a way of 
integrating that new subconscious symbolism into the collective unconscious of the, um, you know, uh, archaic culture. Yeah, sure. So um, in the poem, the author uses the dream state as a setting and he casts um, he casts the, the, the narrative of the poem in the dream state in order to to like um, to engage the speaker on a level that confuses him and that doesn't allow him to see things clearly. So the dream state enables him to see like the shifting images I presented and the symbols um, that are able to take root in a way that doesn't make sense if it happened in reality. So the dream state enables um, the it enables a speaker and the rest of the Anglo-Saxon audience that would have heard the poem performed. Um, it, it enables the the symbols to kind of be deconstructed and put re and put back together again. Hi there. My question is for Lucas, but perhaps we'll have uh, tangents for all of you. I guess I'm wondering about duplicity and feudalism because my sense of the baser nature of Rosencrantz and Guildenstein and some of the other characters who aren't royals is that it's their willingness to be duplicitous that brings them down as much as their social class and so I'm wondering if you found any research or what your thoughts are about character flaws as related to one's place in society and the interaction between those two. Yeah um, so for me really pretty much every major character in Hamlet is duplicitous and willing to be duplicitous in one way or another even Ophelia who's sort of often seen as the most innocent um, is complicit in sort of entrapping Hamlet uh, on the orders of Claudius and Polonius um, and for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern they're not necessarily any more or less duplicitous I would actually argue less than Hamlet and Claudius who I would say are the most duplicitous out of the characters um, but they are punished more harshly for it because of their class um, and it's really the punishment uh, for being duplicitous that we would see as like a moral thing but when um, characters are of, of higher class they're sort of exempted from that punishment because of their power because they would understand that it was a violation of the current class structure, which I was wondering in, in terms of like a Marxist analysis, how does that sort of kind of almost perverse class consciousness, whether class consciousness is preventing sort of accountability and some sort of like revolutionary action, like what you thought about that particular scene? Um, I thought it was actually very interesting um, because as you say, that is sort of the revolutionary class consciousness um, that is described in Marxism as necessary for the, like the uplifting of the working class, but it's sort of been perverted by that feudal order, as you say, to work against their own interests. Um, and there's actually a scene that really interested me um, after Polonius's death, where Laertes sort of leads an angry mob uh, into Claudius's throne room, um, and the mob is chanting Laertes' name and it sort of seems to be intent on deposing Claudius. Um, but what happens very quickly is Claudius sort of takes control over Laertes, saying, no, no, calm down. Uh, let me talk to you and let's work this out. And then Laertes then exerts his control over the mob. So it's sort of the orders pass down the chain and the order very quickly re uh, reasserts itself um, when there is a threat of it being violated, which um, I don't know if that's exactly addressing your question, but I found that interesting as well. Um, this question is also for Lucas, but uh, you two also may have um, other thoughts on it. Um, so at the conclusion of your presentation, you mentioned that you were you seemed overjoyed at the arrest of the, the royals or those who engaged in um, the bribery of college uh, college uh, admissions uh, counselors. Uh, and so um, I may have uh, too quickly jumped to a conclusion about the, the college admissions that you mentioned, um, but how has your study of Hamlet uh, guided your navigation of um, you know the college admissions process, but also perhaps just your your you know broader role in society. Yeah, I mean I think it's really at least for us in this stage of our lives about awareness because um, we don't really have money or an income yet or really the education that um, we're going to have or the experience that we're going to have later in our lives. So it's right now I think uh, as we're learning and just sort of observing the world as we grow up in it about observing these structures um, as informed by Hamlet uh, and other works, just sort of observing how they work in our world and seeing events like this and recognizing that they are a part of this pattern. Um, and then just thinking to ourselves, um, 
maybe there aren't any solutions to be found in Hamlet, but are there solutions to be found in other places like this arrest where justice can be reasserted? Um, and how can we, once we have the power ourselves, participate in that? I had a question for all three of you. I think it's so interesting when we look at older literature and we started with, you know, the dream of the root, an Anglo-Saxon poem, and then something even older, the, the ancient Greek uh, tragedies. Uh, and so both of you uh, talked about how, in a sense, this was almost like propaganda, right? Like used in art in order to shape society. But then we get to Shakespeare and I wonder, <laughs> is, is, you know, is this something different? Is, is as we move through sort of the history of literature, are artists becoming more resistant or trying to point out things that are wrong? Uh, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys can talk about uh, are also those older um, uh, authors subversive in some way of the existing power structures? Sure. So, I mean, with the case with Anthony's presentation about like the, the classical Greek works and, and my presentation, I think it's very obvious that the influence or the, the propaganda is, is is much clearer, and it's not as it's not as obvious if you if you take a if you take a first glance at it. If you look at something like the more modern works like Shakespeare, um, but I think no matter what what piece of literature it is, it doesn't matter if it's modern or if it's not, or I, I don't even think it matters if the person that wrote it intended for it to be propaganda or, or intended to influence people. If it's a work of literature, it, it's inevitably going to influence as many people as possible, or uh, uh, that are going to read it. So therefore, I mean, what the influence is going to be there, whether it's conscious or whether whether it's unintended or subconscious, is because the powers that created the work of literature are there, and they're influencing the people that are reading it, the audience. Yeah, even back then, everyone has an opinion, and there's no mistake that at least the works of Aeschylus and Sophocles have political undertones to them. What I believe is um, just like my point about the ancient media, when they had the ruling councils and like the aristocratic class, they didn't look out for the support of the people. And eventually the multitude of the many will outweigh those in the few um, in power. And Aeschylus and Sophocles, one might look at their motives and be like, there's a lot of civil unrest going around, and so they need to quickly make influences if they want to preserve Athens, which was the center pretty much back then in Greek society. So when they put in these metaphors, you have, they're talking to a pre-literate audience. Not very many people were educated or literate back then, so they have to do it in such a way where it's simple and effective, and that's why you have these literary techniques. Yeah, um, and I think from the Marxist point of view, as you look at history, it's really about who is putting the bread on your table at these different points in history. So if you look at the Renaissance, where most prominent artists operated under a patronage system, where they were paid and sponsored by the nobility, um, you don't get a lot then of sort of like subversion. It's a lot of um, like religious works that are sort of affirming the current social order. Um, and it's not until later on, I think, I mean, there were still artists back then who were more subversive, but because they didn't have access to the same sort of resources, they just didn't get as much visibility. And I think especially now, like in the age of the internet, anyone can make something and post it online. You don't really need, with all the tools we have for free, um, as much sort of uh, patronage or support um, from people in power. So there's a lot more freedom at the moment uh, for artists to sort of criticize the existing power structures. And I think there's a pretty clear pattern of that increasing over time. Just one more point about, about that, and I think all three of us speak to this, but it's kind of the empowerment of the individual or the self, and you see that throughout history. You had Christianity, which sparked like a spiritual, they put everyone on a spiritual playing field where everyone was equal in the eyes of God. Then you could go to another macro event, such as the printing press, and then over here, the internet age. It's just the empowerment of the self and the voice you give to people. Okay, so I think we're going to finish this panel. Thank you so much, and thank you for the questions. Thanks.